Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all are doing well. Welcome to our um, esteemed talk today by Dr. Young Suk Kim. My name is Frances Contreras. I'm Dean of the School of Education here at UCI. I wanted to, um, I'm not going to do the introduction of Dr. Kim, but we are thrilled. Um, as you all are aware, she is an internationally distinguished scholar and researcher who is not only advancing our understanding of writing and literacy, including languages and beyond, but her work is also informing practice and policy to better serve our students in the School of Education. So thank you, Young, for agreeing to um, engage in this discussion and talk with us today. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to share our land acknowledgement. Um, the UCI School of Education acknowledges our presence on the ancestral and unceded shared land of the Gabrielinos and Wajeno Ashaman Nation, which extends from the Santa Ana River to Aliso Creek and beyond. As a land-grant university, it is vital to acknowledge and make visible UCI's relationship to Native peoples to recognize the history of the land on which we stand and to affirm the past, present, and future of Gabrielinos and Wajeno Ashaman Nation here in this place. We recognize that every member of the community has benefited from the use of this land since the institution's founding in 1965, and we acknowledge that the Gabrielinos and Wajeno Ashaman Nation continue to hold strong physical, spiritual, and cultural ties to this land today. This acknowledgement is a call to action to all members of the UCI community to learn more about the Gabrielinos and Wajeno Ashaman Nation and to learn more about this place where we live, work, and study. I'd also like to take this moment to recognize Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander AANHPI Heritage Month, a month dedicated to honoring the rich histories, diverse cultures, and significant contributions of the AANHPI communities locally across our nation um, and for us, education. The diversity of the Asian American community enhances our educational landscape, bringing unique perspectives that enrich learning for everyone. We are inspired by their stories of resilience, innovation, and dedication from AANHPI students, educators, and scholars. Please join me in thanking our community for being here today, but also for Dr. Young Sook Kim for engaging in this wonderful um, discussion with you all. I'm going to turn it over to Liz Pena, who will introduce her with her full bio. Thank you. It's going to be highlights from her bio because her bio is way too long. But um, it is my pleasure um, to um, introduce um, today Young Sook Kim, who is a professor and senior associate dean of the School of Education. I feel like I'm holding this too close. Too much echo? We're OK. All right. Um, she was a former classroom teacher in San Francisco. And her scholarship focuses on understanding language and literacy development and effective instruction for racially, ethnically, economically, and linguistically diverse children. She has worked with monolingual and multilingual kids um, from different um, linguistic backgrounds, including English, Korean, Chinese, Spanish, and Kiswali. And she is an AERA um, fellow. Her work has been recognized by several um, awards, including a 2012 Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers by President Barack Obama. She serves as the Editor-in-Chief for the journal Scientific Studies of Reading, and currently she is chairing the um, Reading Difficulties Risk Screener Selection Panel for the state of California. So this work is work that matters. It work, it's work that affects um, the kids um, and um, that are learning to read in our schools in California and in the nation. Um, today, she's going to be talking um, to us about her work. And welcome. Um, and thank you. And you don't need this. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so, oops, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, so um, my name is Young Su Kim. I, informally, I go by Young. Thank you for taking the time to be here. I study children's reading and writing development for children who come from various linguistic backgrounds. But in celebration and honor of the Asian American, Asian, and the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander, as Heritage Month this year, I mean this month, 
I'm going to focus on diversity in reading development with the particular insights from Asian writing systems. I'm going to reference um, English writing system as well as Spanish and other European language systems, but I'm going to draw from um, Asian writing systems. I also want to recognize that I, I learned, well, uh, May is also Jewish. Uh, American Heritage Month, I also want to recognize that, although I'm not going to talk extensively about it here today. So I know I'm preaching to the choir. Reading and writing are essential and necessary in today's information society. Right? Imagine a day that you don't read or write. Right? It's true in your daily life, your schoolwork, and your workplace. So it is really in this contemporary society, uh, it's basic human rights. It's so critical for your personal growth and also has very important implications for a nation's economic growth. There are some economists look at the impact of reading and writing ability. So here are some words written in different languages. The question that we're going to ask today in this talk is whether and to what extent learning to read words in different languages is similar or different. I'll start uh, with the uh, foundation of theory, and then I'll go with uh, some details related to phonological features and orthographic depth and their roles in learning to read. And I will end with thinking about some implications in terms of uh, literacy development for monolingual students and also by literacy acquisition. And there will be some technical pieces that I'm going to talk about, but I'll try my best to unpack it so that you know, people who are not familiar with the linguistics in uh, reading and writing can follow along. But if you need a little bit of time to process, please let me know so we can pause and process things together. So take a look at this short passage. This is in English. I assume that no one here had a tremendous difficulty reading and understanding this, right? So the question for researchers is, how do we do this? And research in the last five decades has uh, looked into these complexities of reading development and has revealed a considerable amount of information about uh, reading process, process involved in reading, and also skills and knowledge that contribute to the process. One aspect of this work that has to be recognized is that the majority of the work in the past has been with English-speaking children. That itself is not a problem, right? As long as we draw conclusions about this for English-speaking children. The question is, how much do, uh, of the things that we know about the, from these children can be applied to children learning to read in languages other than English? So that's the piece that we want to talk about. And this has been raised before. So in 2008, David Sher uh, pointed out that English is what's called an outlier orthography. If this must, does not make sense to you, I'll go over that in go over this in a few minutes. Okay. In 2021, he pointed out Anglocentrism, Eurocentrism, and alphabetism in reading research. So that's basically research is done with English speaking kids and European speaking kids and with alphabetic writing system. So I'm going to go over some of this. So today, I'm going to unpack this a little bit to broaden our understanding about uh, the diversity in reading development. So let's uh, begin with theory. Theory it explains how things work. In the case of reading, it should explain language general aspects, meaning the things that apply to all different languages, and language specific aspects, things that are unique to some different languages. So it should explain the process and skills and knowledge needed for reading process across languages and writing systems. 
as well as unique aspects that reflect linguistic and orthographic characteristics of different languages. So here's the theoretical model um, that I'm going to draw on today. It's called DEAR. It uh, stands for the Direct and Indirect Effects Model of Reading. Um, so what you see here in this house uh, structure is that you see reading comprehension at the top. That means all else below are needed for uh, reading comprehension. And you see a lot of things. That means that's why reading comprehension is so um, uh, complex, right? But one important aspect of this model is that not only it specifies what skills and knowledge are important for reading comprehension, but also it specifies that these skills are not independent with each other. They're actually related to each other. How are they related? They're hierarchically related, interactively related, and dynamically related. And the one that's directly relevant to today's talk is this dynamic relations hypothesis. And this dynamic relations hypothesis applies to many of the skills and knowledge shown here. But given the time constraints, we're going to zoom in on only the ones in pink. That's the skills uh, that contribute to word reading and spelling, and how different language features that uh, do, uh, I guess, uh, play a role. So let me go over this a little bit. So if we zoom into this pink box, right, and then enlarge it, it looks like this. It has three pieces. So this piece, this theory is called the um, triangle model or the connectionist model, and you see three pieces. Um, orthography, which is about written symbols, and phonology, which is about sound and sound structure, and semantics, which is about meaning. So according to this theory, for us to develop word reading skills, right, for you to see words and be able to recognize and read, or for you to spell words, you need these three pieces of information. Now applying this to the dynamic relations hypothesis, so the dynamic uh, relations hypothesis states the following. The relative contributions of skills and knowledge differ as a function of several factors, including developmental phase of reading, measurements of how constructs, uh, measurements of construct, and language features and text characteristics. And text characteristics includes orthographic depth. And today, we're going to focus on those two feature, uh, features in uh, underlined language features and orthographic depth and how they play a role in terms of uh, the extent to which the three pieces, orthography, phonology, and morphology, and how the extent to which they play a role in word reading differentially across languages. So going back to this different words written in different languages, right? The question now applying the dynamic relations hypothesis is that is the extent to which orthography, phonology, and semantics contribute to word reading similar or different across languages? So to unpack this, let me briefly go over the writing systems. Okay, this is a very simplified version. So writing systems represent oral language. Right, so oral uh, uh, reading, the print is a written language, right? So it represents oral language, but languages differ in terms of what aspects of oral language that oral language is primarily represented by written symbols. So many languages, in many languages, written symbols like alphabet letters represent small a, a sound. And so many languages, the sound that is represented by written symbols that what's called the phonemes. Phonemes are the smallest unit of sound. And I'm going to give you an example in a second. And those languages that, uh, in where the written symbols represent phonemes are called uh, alphabetic writing system. There's also a, a writing system called the abjad where uh, only consonant letters are represented, including Arabic and Hebrew, for example. Now. In other languages, sounds are represented by written symbols, but the sound that is represented by the symbols are not phonemes, but instead syllables. And those have syllabic writing system. Now, on the other hand, there's an entirely different writing system called a morphographic 
a morphographic graphic, meaning the symbols representing meaning morphemes, and that's a different uh, writing system. And many languages is employ uh, represent actually both aspects, some aspects of sound and some aspects of the meaning, and that are represented by written symbols. Now, let's think about this concretely when looking at the word written here. This is a word in English. We'll talk about English not because that should be the reference language, but because the audience here is familiar with you know, English reading, right? So when you look at this, how do you read it? You read it as ka. Why? Because there are, there are, how many letters do you see or symbols? There are three symbols, and those symbols in, in English are called alphabet letters. There are three alphabet letters, and each alphabet letter represents a sound. So k maps onto, uh, no, C maps onto k sound, letter A maps onto A, and the letter T maps onto t sound, right? That's why we read it as a cat, not you know, goat or something else, right? This is English. So English has an alphabetic writing system. How about this? You read it, read it as it's a Spanish word. We read it as gato. Why? Same thing, right? Each letter represents a sound. So g represents g sound, and letter a represents a, and you go on. So that's why we read it as gato. So Spanish also has an alphabetic writing system because each letter represents a phoneme, smallest unit of sound. How about this? This is Korean. Looks unfamiliar to you, I'm sure for most of you, but maybe not, not for all of you. So Korean has a, it does not employ the Roman alphabet letters that you know, is used in English, but it has its own alphabet called Hangul. But the principle is the same. There are three alphabet letters. Uh, so the one on the left, the one on the right, and then the one at the bottom, and each Letter represent a sound phoneme, so you can read it as a cat, right? Korean transcribed version of the word cat. So, Korean, although it looks different, right? It also has an alphabetic writing system. Now, these three example languages all have an alphabetic writing system. Now, put yourself, you're, say you're a kindergartner, you're learning to read, and you, you're looking these. Uh, weird looking wiggly like you know symbols okay trying to see what they say right what skills what do you need to know in this kind of writing system first you have to know those alphabet letters those symbols what they are right you have to know that those represent sounds so they have to know the letters shapes and they have to know associated sounds they also have to know that each word is composed of smallest unit of sound. So cat has three sounds, k, at, so that those three sounds can be mapped onto each letter. That's called phonology and phonological awareness, or phonemic awareness. So there's a huge body of literature that has shown that in alphabetic writing systems, Children's letter knowledge and their phonemic awareness is really strong predictor of how they do in word reading and spelling. So those who know letters, those who have a more advanced phonemic awareness, they do better in word reading and spelling. It's because of the way the writing system is, is designed. Now let's dig deeper a little bit to thinking about features of sound system and how they play a role in learning to read. So going back to the dynamic relations hypothesis, right? Language features matter, and sound is part of language feature. So the question we are asking here in this part is, do phonological features of different languages impact learning to read in those languages? OK. So phonological feature-wise, let's think about syllable types. So again, English, they, uh, most, all of you are familiar with. There are syllable types that I just listed here. There are a lot of syllable types, right? So here, when you see V, V represents vowel, C represents consonant, and a syllable should have a vowel, 
Okay, so if you look at English words, um, there are words, uh, there are syllables that have only uh, a vowel, like O. Oh. There are syllables that have consonant vowel, like two, right? Two has t and U sound, right? So that's consonant vowel. But there are many other types. One that's pretty complicated, if you look at the on the right, uh, this one, for example, it has Consonant, 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 vowel, consonant, consonant, consonant. So there are a lot of consonants that come together without vowels in between. That's actually rare, but English has that. If you think about splint, it has a splint, e, n, t, s, right? So the point here is that English has very complex uh, vowel, uh, I guess, types. What that means is that although in linguistics, vowel, uh, syllable is a very noticeable unit, it is actually pretty difficult to identify uh, syllables or syllable boundaries in English compared to other languages. Let's see how this works in other languages. Going back to Spanish, right, gato. This word has two syllables, ga, do. That syllable ga has consonant and vowel, g, a, and do has g, a, consonant and vowel. And approximately 89% of Spanish syllables are composed of, has a consonant vowel, consonant vowel, consonant, or consonant, consonant vowel, vowel structure. And all of those, and 51% are consonant vowel. That's called open syllable structure. And so um, Spanish has a simple syllable structure. When languages have simple syllable structure, it's much more salient or easy to not notice. And this open syllable structure or simple syllable structure is actually very, very uh, uh, widespread across languages. So English is a somewhat an, an, uh, extreme in that regard. So Turkish, Italian, Korean, Japanese, Kiswa, Hindi, Setswana, those spoken in you know, African context also, they, most of them have very simple syllable structure and open syllable structure. And in these languages, syllables are actually pretty distinct and more noticeable. And your awareness of syllable is more important to word reading and spelling compared to English. Let's look at a word written in Korean. The first, the one on the, your side, I guess, left, um, it's goyangi. It represents goyangi. It means the cat. Just looking at visually, how many syllables do you think there are? Just this part, looking at this part. How many syllables do you think? Just guess. Three, five, I heard. Right? There are three. Uh, one unique aspect of Korean is that, if you think about, uh, let's go actually to English and Spanish. Letters are written in a string from left to right, right? So if you look at cat, C-A-T, from left to right. If you look at gato, from left to right. When you look at gato, it's a two-syllable word. Does it mark where syllable junctures are? Ka is a syllable, to is a syllable. It doesn't mark where syllables are. Korean, interestingly, does mark syllables in written language. So the first one is go syllable, and you can see written in syllable block. Uh, the next syllable, a set of letters assembled to another syllable block, and the last one also has another syllable block. So Korean is called alpha syllabary, where it's an uh, alphabetic language so that each letter represents phonemes, but it represents syllables visually, so it's alpha, alpha syllabary. If I were to write this word in Korean, like in English or Spanish, like European languages, from left to right string, it looks like this. But this is not how it's written in Korean. It's this way. So the Korean language has a, syllable, a simple syllable type. So syllables are salient in oral language. And in the writing system, orthography, syllables are visually represented. Then syllable awareness is very important. In English, syllable awareness is not as important. How about Japanese? Japanese has different writing systems within the language, but we'll talk about Japanese hiragana system, which actually has a syllable, syllabic writing system. So what do I mean by syllabic writing system? So when you see a 
symbol here, this whole thing represents a syllable called ka. Ka has two sounds, phonemes, k, a. But this symbol is not composed of one that represents k sound, one that represents a sound. And you don't combine it. The whole thing just represents the whole syllable called ka. And the next syllable has key. It represents key. It shares the same k sound, right? But there's not no, no relation between these two symbols uh, because uh, each block, each symbol represents a syllable, not phoneme. So in this language, Japanese has also very simple syllable structure. It's called mora. And now uh, the writing system is syllabic. Then your syllable awareness will be also very important, right, compared to phonemic awareness. And that's the case. Now let's go with those. So we're, in terms of phonological word, uh, features of languages, we've been talking about syllable types and how uh, salient syllables are in terms of word reading and spelling. We're going to dig a little bit deeper now in terms of thinking about phonological features. So the word cat is one syllable word in English. It has three smallest unit of sound called phonemes, k, a, and t, right? If I ask you to break down the syllable into two units, not three units of k, a, and t, two units, how would you break it down? Would you break it down as k, a, t, or k, a, t? I hear both. <laughs> It might depend on your uh, first language experience. <laughs> so if you ask native English speakers, the majority of them prefer breaking it into k at. The k part is called onset, and at is called rhyme, spelled as R-I-M-E. It's different from R-H-Y-M-E that you're familiar with. And the reason why uh, English speakers prefer this is because there are a lot of words that share this say the same sound in the rhyme unit. If you think about at, right? At, cat, that, chat, hat, bat, right? So just because, because there are so many sounds that are shared in that unit, you become sensitive to that. And studies have shown that children who are more sensitive or identified, be able to identify this unit, they do better in word reading and spelling because the same spelling patterns are used in this unit. At one point, it was claimed that this onset rhyme segmentation is universal across languages. But of course, I'm going to say no, right? <laughs> and Rosella actually segmented it as differently, actually. <laughs> so if I ask, exactly, that's why. <laughs> so if I ask a Korean speakers to segment the word can, which is the word, you know, can, right, in English, uh, many Korean speakers prefer segmenting into ka instead of k an. And why is that? Because in Korean language, that there are a lot of that C, V, that structure words, and therefore they become sensitive to that, and that's the unit that's important. And studies have shown that children vary in their sensitivity to this unit. Those who are more aware of this unit, they do better in word reading, and spelling. Um, and also, uh, in our previous study, we found that some, when it comes to Korean English bilingual students, what happens to their preference depends on their Korean proficiency and English proficiency, not surprisingly, right? So, according to this right triangle model, three pieces of information are important for word reading and spelling. And studies have shown that students' uh, awareness and knowledge of sound or phonological awareness is important to word reading and spelling across languages. However, the units of sounds that are important to word reading vary across languages depending on the phonological and written language features. Now let's think about orthographic depth, and what do I mean by that? For that, let's go back to this word, right? So we read this word as cat. That seemed very simple. But if you're five years old, is that really that simple? So if you look at the letter C in English, 
it not only represents k sound, but it also represents s sound. It also represents sh sound, depending on the context. Letter A represents multiple vowels. So letter A is a really difficult letter to learn to read in English. It represents a, 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 all these vowels, right? And letter T, a lot of times represents sound, but also represents sh or ch sound, depending on the context. So the point is that in English, there's a one to many relations between letters and sounds and sounds and letters. So what that means is one letter, like letter A, represents multiple sounds, and one sound, like sh, right, is represented by multiple letters or multiple uh, types, you know, groups of letters, right? So when there's one to many relations, it's much harder to learn to read. And this is called orthographic depth. So English has what's called a deep orthography, deep or opaque, because letter sound correspondences are opaque. It's not very clear, right? Letter A representing multiple sounds. So that's an extreme case. But if you look at other languages, um, letter A represent consistently A ah sound in Spanish and Italian, other language, European languages, right? And those are called shallow orthographies or transparent orthographies. And, and the extreme of it, it includes Finnish, but also Spanish is very transparent. Japanese hirakan, although it's a syllabic, it is also transparent. Korean is relatively transparent. It has implications. Learning to read in transparent orthography takes much less time than learning to read in deep orthographies. For example, learning to read in Spanish or Italian, it takes with about one year of instruction. Children can read over 90% accuracy, whereas in English, it takes more than three years to reach, they don't even reach 90% of accuracy. So then you may wonder, why? Uh, what are some reasons for inconsistency in letter sound correspondences in English? There are multiple reasons historically, but here's one. When you look at these two words, there's the same letter sequence, EA sequence, right? But do you pronounce them the same way? The first one, EA, is treated as a unit called a digraph, and together they it represent a long E sound, so you read it as a reach, right? But the second word, it's the same EA, but you don't pronounce it as that long E. You actually, each letter represents a sound, right? React. The reason why is because the second word has two meaning units called morphemes. It, it's composed of two morphemes. One morpheme is re, and the second uh, morpheme is react. It is the act, right? So you put them together, it becomes react. So in English, when we read multiple words that are composed of more than one morpheme, we have to retain the morphological information in pronunciation. So what that means is when children read the words like a cat and reach, they, have, they can read these words successfully by using their knowledge of letters and sound, their associated sounds. When they read words like react, they have to have drawn additionally their knowledge of meaning such as morphological awareness. This is because English has what's called a morphophonological writing system. Earlier I said English has an alphabetic writing system where symbols represent sounds. That's true, that is the primary principle, but the secondary principle is that letters also represent meaning, which is morphemes, and therefore uh, morphology or knowledge of meaning also is important in learning to read and spell in English. So then, our question when it comes to the role of meaning in learning to read words and spelling is, if inconsistency for letter sound correspondences is partially due to the fact that word spelling represent morphology, meaning, in addition to sound, phonology, then relative contributions of meaning, right, semantics, to word reading and spelling might differ as a function of the orthographic depth. So let me say it again. So what that means is when you learn to read in deep orthographies like English where spelling patterns actually uh, represent some meaning, your knowledge of morphological awareness and vocabulary may matter more 
compared to when you learn to read and spell words like in you know uh, Spanish or Italian, where that meaning is not as much reflected in the writing system, right? In the spelling. So to address that, we conducted as a couple of uh, meta-analyses. So in one study, we looked at the extent to which morphology matters to word reading across languages. So we did an extensive literature review. And in the end, we had 232 studies that met the inclusion criteria. And that included over 49,000 participants. And the, uh, these uh, you know, studies were uh, included about 17 languages. And what we found was that morphological awareness was more strongly related to word reading in deep orthographies like English compared to shallow orthographies like Spanish or you know, Italian or Korean. Now, how about vocabulary? Vocabulary is also part of meaning, right? In the triangle, there's a semantics, right? How about the relation between vocabulary and word reading? So children who know more vocabulary words or they have a deeper knowledge of words, do they do better in word reading? And we also, uh, this meta-analysis is currently underway. Um, we have 569 students that met our inclusion criteria. That includes over 150,000 uh, participants. And uh, we found a very similar pattern. Vocabulary is more strongly related to word reading in deep orthographies compared to shallow orthographies. Now, when we think about me, the role of meaning in word reading, we cannot not talk about Chinese. <laughs> Chinese has a completely different writing system. It's a different category of writing system called morphosyllabic. Morphosyllabic meaning, when you look at this part visually, it's called uh, a character, right? And this word represents school. It has two characters. Each character uh, represents a syllable. It also represents a morpheme, a meaning unit. That's why it's called a morphosyllabic writing system. Now, first thing you might notice when you look at Chinese is visually, it's so complex, right? So it's so complex. I'm showing you this. This is Chinese, uh, the traditional Chinese. It's so visually complex so that even in the mainland China, they even simplified it because it's so difficult to learn. This is a simplified version of it. So this matters, right? So if you look at these Chinese words, the first one representing school, the second one representing student, and et cetera, they're all related in meaning, you can tell, right? Because, because it has the same first syllable or character. Because the first syllable represents learning. So all these words have something to do with learning, right? School, learning place, you know, student, someone who learns, right? So this is like in English, uh, if you think about phone, phone, phonology, phon uh, phonetics, uh, what is that, symphony, cacophony. When the word has a phone, it has something to do with sound, right? It gives that clue. In Chinese, it's done much more, that clue is much more extensive and systematic, the meaning clue, right? So in this language, right, learning to read, uh, in learning to read, your knowledge of morphology about meaning and vocabulary matters much more than English or other languages. Also, because of the visual complexity, there's a heavy demand on visual memory. And there's visual, uh, the demand on visual processing. So let's summarize the orthographic depth part, right? So according to this theory, we know that meaning matters. Your knowledge of meaning matters for your ability to read words and spell words. But there's variation across languages because of the relative contributions of, of Morphological awareness and vocabulary to your word reading ability differs across languages as a function of orthographic depth. So, so far I talked about the skills that contribute to word reading and spelling across languages. Then what are some implications? 
Let's think about first monolingual children. If I were to teach early literacy, say, you know, kindergarten or first grade in Korea, for monolingual children who are learning to read in Korean, when I teach phonological awareness, their understanding of sound structure in the language, I will not focus on rhyme awareness. I will focus on the other unit called the body. And I'll you know, focus on syllable awareness and phonemic awareness. But when I teach here in the US for English speaking children or learning to read in English, I will focus on rhyme awareness and phonemic awareness, right? But now let's think about closer to home here uh, in the multilingual context. I think there are some preliminary implications that were some things that for us to think about by literacy acquisition. So when children acquire uh, word reading and spelling skills in more than one language, they have to learn two pieces. One is what's called the language general aspect. So what applies to across languages, right? So they have to learn the, uh, the writing system encodes language. That's a fundamental understanding, right? It encodes a meaning aspect, it encodes a sound aspect. And once you develop that knowledge called the metalinguistic awareness, it transfers across languages. So if I develop this metalinguistic awareness in my first language, say Korean, English, whatever, it transfers to your learning to read on a second language, a third language, and supports and facilitates your learning to read in your second and third language. So that's language general aspect. Now, the second aspect is that the way the writing systems encode language varies. So that's language specific aspects. So you have to learn about how uh, writing systems in English, for example, the writing system in English encodes language versus Spanish versus Korean. That's a unique aspect that students have to learn. So thinking about this language general, language specific, especially uh, uh, for these, let's think about this for bilingual or biliteracy acquisition in terms of two things. One is linguistic distance how far languages are, how distant languages are, or how closely related languages are. And then orthographic dif distances, how closely and you know, how far uh, ortho orthographies of languages, right? And we'll think about this because these have, have implications about what's transferable between languages in biliteracy or multiliteracy acquisition and some unique aspects of a learning demands and some strategies. Uh, so um, to be concrete and specific, let's think about different language pairs, right? Different like bilingual programs, for example. So we'll think about Spanish English, Korean English, and Chinese English. So let's start with the Spanish English. Linguistically, right, linguistic distance-wise, they are close, right? Um, so that means they're closely related. And for example, there are lots of cognates. Cognates are words that are shared in two languages that have the same, a similar pronunciation, so same, I guess, same similar pronunciation, spelling, and meaning. Right, there are false cognates, but there are a lot of true cognates between English and Spanish. So in the Spanish English bilingual context then, Cognitive awareness instruction is important and could be very beneficial, right? So that children can actually benefit from similar you know, vocabulary words and also benefit from you know, for, uh, word, uh, word reading and spelling as well. In terms of orthographic distance, Spanish English is also close. It uses the same alphabet, uh, Roman alphabet letters. It comes with benefits and some costs. So the benefit is that students don't have to learn a new set of alphabet letters, right? What is, then what is additional work? That can be confusing because the same letter in English represents some sounds. Same letter could rep it represent different sounds in Spanish, right? So that's, uh, we see that actually in our work with the Spanish and English bilingual children, we see that students applying uh, English uh, spelling patterns in Spanish writing 
and applying English, uh, Spanish spelling patterns in their English writing. And that's really much, very much in line with the translanguaging idea, right? Then what that means for teaching is that children really need to learn the specificity of right, letter sound correspondences in English versus in Spanish. Let's think about Korean English and Chinese English. These are linguistically distant. There, there's no cognitive, essentially very, very, very little cognates, right? So cognate awareness uh, instruction does not make sense. So there's a greater learning demands for language. Studies have shown that learning Korean from English speakers or Korean speakers learning English takes two to three times more time and effort. The same thing with Chinese English, right? So the language demand is much greater in these languages. Korean English pair, um, Students have to learn two different sets of alphabet letters. But the same alphabetic principle applies, and students can use that, right? So English, you know, letter C represent, you know, a K sound. So letters represent sound. That's pretty much the case in Korean. Because the alphabet letters look different, there's no really a good chance of confusing, right, the mappings, right? So there's that benefit of it. When it comes to Chinese English, this is linguistically distant and orthographically also very distant. So linguistically, there are few cognates, for example. Orthographically, the mapping units are different. In, in English, alphabet letters represent sounds. In Chinese, the smallest units are called a radical, and each radical has a lot, most of them have multiple strokes. And radical, some radicals represent sound, some ra radicals represent meaning, and the mappings are not very consistent, or the semantic radicals are much more consistent. So the learning demands are very different here. So then when you teach in this Chinese English bilingual program, then when you teach reading uh, in English and Chinese, the approaches, they're shared uh, pieces, but they're also they're quite unique pieces that you have to address. So um, in learning to read, we have to recognize uh, language general aspects. We also have to learn uh, language specific aspects. And we learned a lot from studies um, from, with English speaking children in the past five decades. But it has been really encouraging to see a substantial number of studies now conducted with children learning to read in languages other than English. And this has really important implications because this line of work allows us um, to provide appropriate support for students from different language backgrounds and different cultural backgrounds and help us embrace diversity and capitalize on diversity. So with that, I really appreciate your time and attention. Thank you for making the time to be here today. Thank you. All right, we have one question from the audience. Stephanie. Thank you for those who, like, I don't work in this area at all. So you did an excellent job of explaining really complicated things that have everyone around me who's bilingual already knew this. But so I was thinking about languages where the phonemes have nothing really to do with the visual presentations, like Chinese is, could be in Cantonese or Mandarin, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking about like reading comprehension. Is the uh, ability for reading comprehension much higher when you're not distracted by the sounding out process? Like working with young kids, they sound it out and then they don't remember what they were mm -hmm. just read. Right, right. <coughs> Sorry, allergies. Um, so when you think about character systems, do you read it as a package and comprehension is much more um, intuitive or faster? Like are there things to learn about these character systems beyond the phonemic awareness space? Does that make sense? Ah, yeah, that's a great question. So I think there are a couple of pieces there. One is oral reading versus silent reading that you're talking about. Uh, research is kind of mixed about oral reading versus silent reading, which one is supported, facilitates reading comprehension. Studies so far suggest that you know, when you're uh, beginning a reader and when you're a struggling reader, actually um, you know, oral reading does support because it forces you to attend to every single word, right? Uh, whereas when you, you know, we're reading proficiency develops and silent reading is definitely more efficient and supports your reading comprehension again, you know, without the demand on the word, you know, attention and working memory, right? So that's one piece. 
Um, the other piece you talked about is reading comprehension in different languages, like you know, Chinese, for example. Um, th so the, the basic idea is that across languages, regardless you know, Chinese alphabetic writing system or you know, different writing systems, they have to develop word reading proficiency, right? Because you know, reading involves reading print, right? So you have to recognize words instantaneously, right? So that's word reading proficiency. And then you have to have language proficiency, right? You, if you can decode very well, for example, I can decode Turkish very well because I know the letter, I know the letter sound correctly, but I have no clue about what it says, right? So I lack that language comprehension, therefore there I lack uh, reading comprehension there. Um, you know, even in the case of Chinese, you need to be able to re uh, recognize words or characters really efficiently, and you need to have language comprehension there, right? The fact that characters are composed of like radicals and the, the mapping of radicals to sounds and meaning are less consistent, um, but still does not mean that the word reading proficiency develops somewhat well. In, it still means that children need to uh, develop an understanding of subcomponents and then being able to put them together and recognize the unit, the character, and then put them together as word, right? So the word reading proficiency is rec requisite part. So I think that's one piece. The other piece is the role of phonological awareness in Chinese. Although it's not as consistently represented as in English or in any other languages, it does, it is represented, and studies have shown that children's awareness of phonology and phonological structure does contribute to word reading and spelling. Yeah. Other thoughts and questions? Conversations. <laughs> no other questions? Yeah, oh, Carol. Oh, English teacher, English language arts teacher in a in a culturally diverse school where you have kids in your classroom who are come from homes where they speak Korean at home or they speak Chinese or whatever, and you're a teacher who's monolingual and speaks English. How how what can you do to help all those kids sort of get on the same page? Well, wow, that's a great question, and I think there are multiple answers there. <laughs> that kind of a classroom environment is really the de facto here in the US, right? Although there are bilingual programs, that's pretty limited. There are multiple things that I think the teachers can do. The first one is really closely communicate with the parents and learn about what parents can do in their first language, right? Well, just the fact, just because the child speaks the, you know, a, a language other than English does not mean that the child actually has literacy skills in that language. So you need to find out whether the child has literacy skills, and if not, whether the parents is uh, able to help acquire, right? And that actually has some implications. The other one is the teacher cannot speak the child's language, and that's just the way it is. But I think there are two important implications. One is the teacher's attitude and appreciation of the diversity where children come from, what the things that children bring in, right? That is the attitude. The other piece is that really systematic and explicit instruction of what we know, if this is about learning to read in English, when they provide that systematic instruction that supports their learning ability, their reading ability in English, and then at the same time, if they are learning in, you know, in, in other languages, this it can be actually supported. The ones that the things that they learn in English can transfer in learning to read in other languages, for example. So I think those are some things that the teacher can do. If you have any other suggestions and the things that you have seen in the classroom, absolutely feel free to share. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yeah. Oh, hey, hi. I'm thinking about the ancient uh, ancient house slide with the top, the reading comprehension, right. and the, all the factors supporting the reading comprehension. Uh -huh. And one of the pillar was uh, listening comprehension. Uh -huh. And I'm uh, curious because when I watch like American mu movies, especially like Western movies where they speak in like Texas dialect, <laughs> yeah, I, I need uh, captions because I can understand less than 50%. Yeah. Although, uh, you know, usual movies, I can understand, I would say like 80, 90%. So I'm uh, wondering if the reading comprehension, in order to do reading comprehension really well, mm -hmm. do you need to be able to understand like dialect 
by uh, like oral dialect mm -hmm. well too, and how does it uh, relate it? Like listening comprehension to the reading comprehension. Yeah. So that's my question. Yeah, that's a great question. And so I, I actually one of, one line of my work is that listening comprehension side of it. So um, absolutely. So listening comprehension theoretically, the reason why it's in the pillar is because if you remove that pillar, the building collapses. That means there's no reading comprehension. That's why it's represented as pillar. So that means it's a critical, it's a necessary skill, right? Um, to answer, the short answer is yes. If you're, um, you know, um, watching something or listening to something in a particular language or the dialect version of it, you need to have a comp listening comprehension of that dialect or that version, right? Um, so that's the example that I had, right? In Turkish, I can decode words. I have no reading comprehension because I have no listening comprehension. But listening comprehension is a very complicated construct, very complex. It's as complex as reading comprehension, except for the word reading part of it, really. So if you look at, you know, we don't have the slide. Under the listening comprehension pillar, there are two stones underneath. The stones that right underneath has what do we need to develop listening comprehension? We need to have so-called higher order thinking skills, right? So we need to be able to make inferences. We need to understand different perspectives, right? When I tell you a story, oh, the brief uh, passage that I showed you in English, right? Remember that one? The wife said, oh, why do you go for it? And do, what, what, I forget the exact wording. Um, are you not ashamed going for a fourth time? Uh huh. And the husband said, "No." I told them it's for you, right? For you to understand that. Say you heard it. You didn't read it. You heard it. For you to understand that, you have to make inference about why going for ice cream for four time is embarrassing. This. That's an inference. It didn't say it, right? You also may have to have understanding of different perspectives. The husband's perspective. The wife's perspective and the party goers, people that are in the present, right? What do they think about who got the ice cream, who the ice cream was for, right? That's perspective taking, right? You also have to monitor our comprehension. We also have to understand all the words used in the sentence. You also have to have an understanding of syntactic. Well, you have to have a syntactic knowledge because words are arranged in a certain way and then you know generate meaning, right? So all these pieces are needed for listening comprehension. Is exactly identical for what's needed for reading comprehension, except that reading comprehension requires uh, you know, word reading. So to get to the point, yes, when I listen to British accents, some accents in Britain, right, I have a tremendous difficulty understanding it because it's, I don't have the language piece. Yeah. OK, well, thank you so much. I think that's all we have time for today, but stick around. We're going to continue conversations, and um, thank you all for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.